Okay. First of all, thank you everybody for joining. Um, this is our 10th Platform Academy session already. So this is very exciting. It's almost like a small jubilee. <laughs> Um, I am very glad this series has been helpful for so many people so far. Um, and today we have a special new topic for you. So we're diving into the world of workflows and not just platform foundation. Just before um, I get into things, I want to make sure that you're all aware of the lovely safe harbor notice that we always have. Most of the time we stay within um, released products, but today we'll actually have a couple of forward-looking statements. So just to make sure, don't make any purchasing decision based on anything that I'll be talking about today. All right, so today's topic is about all about decision management. So specifically in the form of decision tables and decision builder. My name is Lisa Hohenstein. I'm an outbound product manager for the Creator Workflows and now Platform. Um, I've been with ServiceNow for almost three years now, and I've had my first contact with the Now Platform during the Geneva release. So that was already like six years ago. Incredible. <laughs> I've been hooked to the power of the platform right from the start, so I'm very glad to be able to evangelize it in this Academy series. In our um, crew, we also have Kiernan. Do you want to say some words? Yeah, hi, yeah, I'm Kiana McMorrow. I am also a product manager with the Creator Workflows Group. And uh, I've been inside the ServiceNow infrastructure for about six plus years. And I've only been actually directly with ServiceNow for a couple of months now. And it has been a whirlwind. But luckily, <laughs> I, I have uh, Lisa in the same boat and, and Adam and Mark helping me row in the right direction. So I'm incredibly happy to be, be here and learning, learning. Awesome. Okay, I can see we also have Julia Perlis in um, the viewership. I've just promoted you to a panelist, so if you want to, you can also say a word or two about yourself. Hi, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Show my video here. There we go. Um, I'm Julia Perlis. I'm a product manager on the um, platform team as well, on the workflow and integration team. And um, I have spent a lot of time this past year working on um, guiding the development of Decision Builder, which is the product that Lisa will be um, showing off and, and talking a little bit about today. Um, so, you know, really, really excited to have people start using it, get some feedback, and uh, hope that this makes your business logic lives a lot easier. <laughs> Thank you so much for joining us. Um, for those who don't know yet, Julia will also be on the Creator Toolbox live stream tomorrow. That is at, I think, 8 a.m. Pacific time or 5 p.m. Central European time um, with Red Tilton and doing a live demo of Decision Builder and answering questions and everything um, then as well. Um, but thank you again for joining this one. Um, Julia will also um, check out the chat and your questions. So please don't, um, don't forget to post your questions in the Q&A panel. We'll answer them as we go. And if you ask any questions that we can't answer right away, we'll also post a summary of all questions and answers on the community after the session. This session will, as always, be recorded and also uploaded to YouTube by the start of next week. So. Um, if you um, have friends or colleagues or other interested parties who don't know about decision management yet and decision builder, but um, are a good audience for this, be sure to share this out with them as well. All right, and with that, let's get into this. Um, first, before we get started, I want to start a small poll with two questions, just to get an idea of how much you already know about decision tables or decision management, and how often you encounter decisions in your daily work. While you answer, I will just start with the first couple of slides here. What are decisions? Well, let's start with the basics. Decisions will need inputs. And based on those inputs, like for example, giving in some kind of data about a user or request or requested item, a task or anything, we can determine conditions. So for example, a user, is he maybe a VIP? Does he, uh, is he associated with a specific location or other things? Is something larger or smaller? This can be um, referring to a price, to loyalty, loyalty points or priority. Or something is between different other data points. So for example, dates or numbers or things like that. 
And when you have walked through your decision tree or your decision table, you will come to a result. So any decision will lead to a result that can be used in your further logic. So this can be, for example, an assignment group or a discount uh, percentage, tax rates, an approver, or even return policies. So at any given time, you will have something like this. Like you will have decision tables for um, hardware or software approval. This is one of the more complex examples that is based on a couple of different inputs. And then um, the result will be the person who has to approve something. This can be like this for hardware or like this for software. So just keep this in the back of your mind before we go on. All right, let's look at the poll. We have many people who have not even have heard of decision tables, which is good. So about a quarter haven't heard of them at all. I hope this will be um, enlightening you and give you an idea what they're for. And um, there are at least two people who have heard of them and tried them out or are even using them regularly. That is interesting, but there's a lot of potential and that's why we're doing this session. Okay, and the second is how often are you creating complex logic to make decisions? And that is, of course, some applications, but also multiple times per application. Yes, all of the time. Like we have to make decisions everywhere in our applications, right? So decision management. What are decision tables anyways? We have actually introduced decision tables back in Madrid. I didn't even know they were around for so long. Uh, before I researched for this session. I, I knew they've been around, but Madrid really surprised me. So what did this look before the release of Decision Builder? Well, the experience was a regular old list and forms um, experience, and it was a little harder to get started. And you would have to know how to create um, the correct components that you need for your decisions. And despite this being highly functional, we know that this wasn't the best experience and the adoption numbers unfortunately prove that. So this is why we decided to fully rework the decision creation experience. And our teams worked very hard to bring you a powerful builder that enables you to quickly and easily create and maintain decision tables while also aligning with key industry standards. What else do we need for our decisions? We need some form of result. In our current iteration, you will have to have some form of table that you um, pick and choose from in your result column. So you will either use an existing table, and that can be users, locations, or config items, or maybe even a credential aliases. Or you can also use um, a custom table. So use, use up all of your custom bundle tables that come with your product to create um, tables that return discount levels or re reward program levels, tax brackets, whatever you need for your custom app or your app extension. Keep an eye out for what we share later. So in upcoming releases, we'll introduce more options and variety to assigning results. Where can I use deci decision tables? So right now there are two main places to use them. And the um, default version that I will recommend is Flow Designer. So this has been, again, this has been around pretty much as long as we had decision tables. So there's a flow logic that is called make a decision. And we go through that in a bit. You can use decision tables in Flow Designer to then create or update records, ask for approvals, or send notifications. So basically add any business logic, any flow logic that you would um, want to use in those decisions, right? In those branches or just after. And the second path that we have is the decision table API. This can be used scoped or global. And you can use this, for example, to create a custom control for a virtual agent to um, get a decision before you continue your path in the conversation with the customer. You can also create maybe custom flow action script, use it in UI builder client scripts or any other script field that you encounter. This will help you make your scripting life easier as well. We'll also take, take a peek at what other spaces we think decision tables can be used going forward in our Outlook. All right, decisions in Flow Designer. So to get an idea of how complicated decisions can become if you go the, the um, if, else, if, else 
um, route or even in scripting if you use uh, case switch constructs, it can get quite complicated and it can be hard to interpret them if you encounter them. So trying to figure out if you're in the right on the right level, have you moved another if, another if, and another if indented and where am I? When do I add my logic? Am I in the right path? It's, it's rather complicated. And the good thing about decision tables and the make a decision flow logic is that it will remove most of this complexity from your flows. So looking at the decision and flow designer, you can add this. It's in the flow logic category. So there's actions, there's flow logic, and there's subflows. And um, in the middle one, you can pick make a decision, and then you um, can add a label pick the correct decision table that you want to work with. And then you have a couple of options. One of them is to use branches. And I'll explain that in the next slides. You have execution, that is either the first decision that matches or running all of the decision that match. And there's also the option, when you use the branches, you can include an otherwise path. So this is like the catch all else. If anything, if everything else fails or none of the conditions match, then we'll go the otherwise path. Making a decision with decision uh, tables um, using branches, you can add multiple action to create specific business logic for each result path. So additional approvals, extra checks, additional tasks. And we, give you some, we can give you some recommendations on when you should use the branches over when to use them not. So the most obvious answer is if the steps following the decision are the same in principle, maybe except for an, a variable or two, then you should not use branches because if the steps are the same, ask for approval, create a task, change a state, all of them are the same and you can just input some variables, then skip the branches. Just do your logic and use the output from the decision as your variables. However, if the process is very different or the actions cannot be configured uh, with data from the decision, or you need a catch all otherwise path, then you may want to branch. So if the process is generally the same, regardless of the decision result, or you have to configure a high number of decisions or decisions might even change later, try to avoid the branches. This will allow you to only configure the following process once, and have it, have it work for all result paths. And you also won't have to touch the flow again if the decision table changes. So it, just imagine you add another row or two and add another decision um, a, a result option. You'll have to touch the flow again to, um, to uh, include actions after that branch. Really, and really the, keep, it, keep it as simple as possible unless you absolutely need to. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, always. All right, so what does this look like? Um, on the left side, we can see the branched version. And you can already see that the ask for approval is just repeated four times. If you skip the branches, as on the right side, you can see that we only have to ask for an approval once. And then we can also um, use the approver field that is on my result table as an input for my approval. So without uh, using branches, you'll have to do that to each individual brand, a branch. And without the branches, you can add the logic just right beneath the decision. So much for branches. Running the first or all decisions that match, that one is pretty much on the nose, so I won't say too much about it. Sometimes you want to just have one result, and sometimes you may want to execute different uh, logics at the same time or sequentially. The default setting will be to only run the first decision that matches, and the decision making will stop after that. And keep this also in mind when creating your decisions. So you can order your decisions in the decision table and it will run from the top to the bottom. So you can reorder the decision and decision builder and the conditions will always be checked in an order. And if you only um, want to use the first decision that matches, make sure they have the right priority. If you want to run the flow actions and logic for all matching results, each branch will be executed. So if you unchecked uh, the use branches options, you will then have access to a list, a record list of results, and you will be able to iterate this result list with a for each logic. And that looks like this. 
So the output of the decision will give you an ordered list item that you can pull into for each item. And then iterate through those and again, use the data pills as you need them. So much for the fun part and the introductions um, mm -hmm. about decision management before we head into decision builder. Do we have any questions so far? I don't see any in the Q&A currently. It's really great that you have the ability to iterate over um, that kind of list of items that were generated from there. So you don't have to kind of continually rebuild. That's that's a really great feature I hadn't noticed previously. Yeah. All right. Now that we know how to use decision tables, let's look at the new decision builder. And I'm I'm sure Julia is super proud for you to get your hands on it. The decision builder is an intuitive and user-friendly interface to create decision builder. It had its initial release just recently, and it is available on the ServiceNow store. Um, Julia, correct me if I'm wrong, but it is um, available to all customers, right? Yes, that's correct. Perfect. Awesome. So um, from the store, I take that the current version, which is 1.1.0, is compatible with Quebec and Rome instances. So you don't necessarily have to wait for upgrading to Rome to make use of it. And it's uh, currently available um, in your instances for admins. And there's read-only access with decision table reader role. And it's currently only accessed through the application navigator. And that is through um, going to decision decision management and then decision builder. Julia will do a full demo of this thing tomorrow, but just to give you some um, idea of how it looks, I got some screenshots prepared. So here's the, I am sorry, my neighbors are drilling holes right now. <laughs> we do have a question in the chat, Lisa. Uh, yes. Somebody said no additional cost. That is correct. That not for correct. at least not for installing it. The starting page of Decision Builder will give you all of the available decisions, and you will see that there are already a couple of decisions um, there out of the box that uh, we're using decision tables for our um, change workflows. So for uh, determining change approval policies, those can already be found in decision tables. When we create a new decision table in Decision Builder, we can choose to have different kinds of inputs. We can either input a task or a record of, of which we will then go ahead and create our conditions based off of fields in this table. The alternative is we can also create just manual inputs and decide, okay, maybe we have a cost or an item type or availability just in um, manual inputs right there. Those can currently be a choice, decimal, number, string. I think those are the most important um, types for those inputs. And date. And date, thank you. Yes, of course, date. It makes sense. If you add a condition, so um, as you can see in the in the top, I have a demo task. So this table was extended from task. And if I do so, I can add a condition column from that input. And in that um, definition, I can decide whether to um, make my condition based off of the reference record or a specific field on this record. And in this case, I had um, added the price field. I can decide my, my approvals based off of the price of something. This is a full view of the details with manual inputs. So you can see that each of the column headers have a different color. Um, you, you can see the same color. If I go back to this slide, you can see the color um, next to the inputs. If I um, add an input from a task, all, col all columns will be represented with the same color because there are fields on the same table from the same input. So this will help you if you have multiple references um, or multiple tables and manual inputs to determine which of the columns, which of the conditions come from which input. I can see how that'd be super useful. I uh, have previously worked and uh, taken highlighters and actually made changes to fields so I could map them where they were from on a piece of paper. So that's super, super helpful. Yeah, so this is what it looks like then in the, in the full view um, with the record inputs. So the different fields that come from the same record and that will be represented um, in this table. And then as if you remember the two tables I showed before, so um, having the, the hardware and the software, in this case, we can make all of the decisions in the same table. A lot of you will probably ask yourselves or ask us, so when do I use this? Like, 
how, how much sense does it make to go this way instead of my if then else and case switch constructs that I have always used and I'm familiar with them? Why should I use decision tables? Well, first of all, decision tables are reusable. So if you make the same decisions again and again, it is easier to use decision tables. You could say, well, of course, I could just put them in subflows and reuse the subflows. But just think about how much more powerful this could be if you combine decisions with reusable subflows or even bring dynamic subflows into the mix. So based on decisions you make with your decision tables, run other subflows dynamically. That can be super powerful, but still make your flows be much more readable than before. So a prime example for this can be approvals for catalog items. Just create a subflow with the decision and adding all of the flow, uh, all of the actions that should follow that decision once and reuse that subflow again and again and again. You don't have to recreate that all the time for all of the catalog items. The second major importance is what I've already mentioned. So this reduces complexity. It makes your flows and your scripts so much easier to read when you don't have to interpret multiple layers of conditions, like all of the indents and the indents and the next indent, and there's another layer of if then else, and then you get lost and forget where you were. Just remove all that baggage and make one decision table to decouple your logic from your decision paths. And then finally, and I think this is the most important aspect for your consideration, is ownership. Who owns those decisions and conditions? Are those people maybe people outside of the ServiceNow dev teams or even outside of IT? Who needs to make the changes to them and how often can you adhere to change or release cycles, which you would have to if you were to change your flows and subflows? Or do you need to work outside of those cycles? Do you have to update decisions maybe more often? So that is really one of the most powerful things is because you can give access to decision tables to business people, line of business um, owners, the, one, the people who actually decide how high or how low the, the threshold is before you need an approval for a request. And if any of those questions have been answered with yes, you should strongly consider removing decisions from your code and from your flows and create decision tables instead. Next up would be some outlooks. So let's take a quick break for questions about decision builder so far. I think everybody's just blown away by you know, <laughs> all the different ideas that they're coming up with right now. Yeah, I will have some more ideas later um, because I added some use case things that came to my mind, but I'm sure you will come up with even uh, more awesome use cases. Okay, so now that you've learned about decision tables and decision builder, I'm sure you're very curious about what's next for decision management. And as pointed out as this, at the start of this presentation, any of the plans and ideas I'm going to go through here, they are st still subject to change. So until they're released and on the store, I don't make any promises. So apps th released through the ServiceNow store can um, have the benefit that they can have more frequent releases than our usual family release schedule. And generally, we will include a previous version in, of that app in a later family release. So for example, in this case, Decision Builder, is, I think, is planned to have new releases on the store in December and early 2022. Um, and, but the current version that is out right now will also be included in, I think, the next family release. So if you want the newest version, you can always update from store if you want to use the stable version that just comes with your family release. You can also do that when San Diego comes out. So let's head into our outlook. Decision management is enhancements. We're currently working on these enhancements. We want to integrate Decision Builder into App Engine Studio because, duh. <laughs> I mean, it makes sense. If we want to provide uh, low and no code users with the option to create their own applications, they will also want to create their own decision tables. And we want to make sure that they have access to this builder in a cohesive experience within App Engine Studio. And to facilitate the access management to the builder and decisions, we'll of course include decision tables into the delegated development functionality. So you can determine 
which decision tables a given developer has access to. There is a question coming in. Can we install this in a developer instance? That is a very good question. Do you know, Julia? Yes, you can <laughs> install in a personal development instance. Awesome. Thank you so much. One of the enhancements that I've already alluded before is we want to give you more options for the results so that in a future release, uh, we want to allow you to assign multiple results to result tables to a decision and also add more field type options for those results. And this is to make um, also, in a way, custom tables optionals, optional for your decisions. The drilling drives me nuts. I'm so sorry. <laughs> so more options for results is numbers, strings, dates, the same data types that we actually also have in the inputs. We will still want to have uh, custom result tables for a couple of use cases. So I don't think this is going to uh, go away very far because the benefit of having a custom result table is that you can also add more fields to that. In my example, I had a result table for my approval and I added the reference field to a user or to a group. Let's get into our vision and ideas. So the first slide that I showed you are things that we're actively working on. The items on this sl slide are less concrete than the previous, um, so we still wanted to share some product ideas with you and want to know which one of those sound most interesting to you so that we can prioritize the next releases. We'd love to offer the option to edit decisions in Excel to further include business stakeholders and non-developers in this process. We're also looking at more integration outside of um, AES. So for example, integrating decision tables or decision builder into process automation designer, virtual agent assignment rules, and also data lookup rules. We also think that adding a process to submit changes to a decision table for approval and adding a review process will be of great value, as well as adding support for draft and published states, as well as versioning. Please get in touch with us. If you have any questions, ideas, requests, or feedback about decision management and decision builder uh, as you start to use it, you can either reach out to us through the community on this session thread um, in the YouTube comments, or just send me an email. Um, my address is at the end of the slide deck, and I will also share that on the community post app, um, after the session. All right. So there is another question coming in from Joshua. Joshua has already used decision tables and got stuck with having them tied to answer tables. Yes. So instead of making something like a two column list, yes, this is promising, definitely. So this is one of the um, um, things that we want to solve with the upcoming release is that you don't necessarily have to have an answer table for this. Poll time, more polls. So now we'll have two more questions. Thank you, Kiernan. Um, to go through the options that we've um, just talked about. So we would like to know which of those features and ideas that I've mentioned are most interesting to you. So what would you like to see come into, um, into life in our uh, platform? And then uh, we're also interested in um, knowing which persona would you want to give the option to create and edit decision tables. So both of those questions are multiple choice. So just check any of the boxes that are relevant to you. And while you do that, I'll start with some example use cases that I could come up with. So decision builder, when could you use it? There's industry opportunities everywhere. So for example, if you're working with service providers or in customer service, you could use this to decide on customer reward program levels, like deciding discounts, return policies, offer a different selection maybe in the service catalog, deciding on which kind of service the customer gets. Does he get extended service 24 seven or extended warranty, maybe early access for new products. All of those decisions can be made with decision tables. We have examples in education. So for example, if you're in university, you could um, assign counselors based on the student's um, housing, the student needs, maybe their special needs, they need accommodations, maybe they um, have a specific education progress or are still a junior or need senior uh, guidance or um, different uh, help. Assigning students to dining halls um, based on their housing or eligibility. You can make um, other accessibility accommodation decisions, like do they need 
maybe uh, an accessible building? Do they have to be in a different um, campus housing or do they need extended deadline needs or whatever? So education is where it's at. Um, if you're working for an energy provider, you can recommend different energy plans to your customers based on their decisions. Do they want to add renewable en energy options in their plan? What kind of consumption do they have? Maybe they are a referral from another customer and so on and so on. There's more. <laughs> Finance, <laughs> credit decisions. Credit decisions can be made uh, based on uh, decision tables. Take into account prior credits, credit score, loyalty programs, salary. Maybe they have a cosigner or not. Do they bring securities? And finally, the things that you're probably most familiar with are IT workflows. Think about integrations. Maybe based on a specific decision, a person is in a different uh, department or assigned to in a different region. Maybe they use Teams, maybe they use Slack, maybe they just use emails. So combining decision tables with integrations, make your decision through what channel you want to send your notification based on user criteria. While I was working on this, I thought, well, when I was a customer, we had this giant, I mean, humongous inbound email script, and it was insane. We had all the if, then, else, and case, and switch things only to determine the right queue and the right team to assign the task to. We didn't have machine learning. So this would have been so much easier if I had had access to decision tables back then, but we didn't, unfortunately. So this is a, a great example that I found. And before we head into the q and I'll publish the results of our decision management polls. All right. Okay, so the majority of people want to share with ServiceNow people. That makes sense. Um, but also, 7 out of 11, like 60%, are interested to share decision tables with citizen developers and business or process stakeholders. That is awesome. That is just the right mix. So I am, I am excited to see that you think this is a good builder and a good experience for those people. And what are you interested to see? Oh, every, everything is interesting, Julia, but assignment rules seems to take the cake. So that is the most important thing here. Everything else is pretty much at the same level. <laughs> While you were speaking, you know, about the different use cases, I, I definitely could see how um, VA uh, having that uh, integrated with uh, virtual agent could be, I mean, a massive game, game changer for a lot of folks. Yeah. Uh, because as you said, you know, you can provide kind of a very customized and tailored uh, experience for people based on, you know, some of the input that they might share and, and definitely uh, going to be a big thing in the next couple of years, I think. Yeah. All right. That's was all I have prepared so far. So more questions, give me all your questions and we'll try to answer them. All right, so Mark has confirmed in the chat that it's available on the PDI in the plugin list version 110, that is the current version. So that is very good to know. And Ashley says having it in AS will be really nice. Yes, absolutely. I think it's a, it's a good place to put decisions. Um, especially when while you're already working on your custom app and you have everything in one place. There don't seem too many new questions. I think there will be more once you get started with the product. And I'm really curious to see what Julia will, will show us tomorrow and what else is, is possible with this. Or we head into our final round of, of text. We'll have the last um, poll. There don't seem to be more questions, so let's just get your feedback, how you like this session. This is the, the poll that we always do, and just to be able to compare different uh, things. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Julia, for joining. Thank you, Kiernan, for co-hosting me. Um, thank you so much for joining the session and your questions. Don't miss the Creator Toolbox um, on the ServiceNow Dev Program channel tomorrow. I have prepared the link somewhere and I will post it in the channel just in a second so you don't miss it. There we go. This is the YouTube, it's already scheduled. Make sure to also follow the post for this, uh, this link. A quick outlook on the Academy schedule for the next weeks. So I just found out today that 
Today in two weeks is a holiday in the US. Uh, apparently that's <laughs> Thanksgiving, so we might have to reschedule the next session. Please follow the uh, parent blog of, for all of those Academy sessions to make sure you get info and, and the newest links and info on, on when uh, and which topics we, we have. We do have a couple of very interesting topics planned with a couple of um, outbound product management colleagues as guest speakers over the next weeks and months. We have my, my colleague Mike come in for a view at platform security. We'll have Amanda Jocelyn come in to speak about now experience framework and we'll have our colleague from Australia join us in, in the middle of his night <laughs> and um, present something about mobile app build. It will be really interesting. We'll take a break for the holidays and New Year's, so there will definitely be no sessions on December 23rd or January 6th, and we'll resume our bi-weekly cadence then on January 20th. And as always, this session will be edited and uploaded for sharing and re-watching on YouTube, so you can follow the community post and be notified when that happened, and then you can also see the full list of Q&As from this session and be sure to link this out with any to any colleagues or friends that you would think this is interesting. We'll also post the slide deck to make sure you have all of the resources and available material and links and everything. And That's it. Like we got uh, some results back. Oh yes, yeah. let's look at the results. Thank you. Awesome. That looks good. Ah, I love the would you attend again <laughs> option. <laughs> I always hope you come again. And I have already seen a couple of recurring faces or names. So I'm super glad this is helpful to everybody. Yes. All right. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Have a wonderful day. Thank you very Bye. much, Lisa. That was awesome. Thanks, Lisa. <laughs> Thanks, everybody. See you guys. Bye-bye.